the 10th chapter, verse number 25 through 37. The Bible says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? Look at your neighbor and say, how do you read it? Verse number 26, what, uh, uh, 27, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And, let church say and. Hey, Chris, love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> oh, look at your neighbor and say, that's where you get in trouble. Love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28, you have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? <laughs> Verse 30, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have had. Uh, which of these three, look what Jesus asked him, which of these three? do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Verse 37, the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Go and do, look at your neighbor and say, go and do likewise. Ah, I want to preach and teach from this subject as a spirit should guide. Don't ask my neighbor. Don't ask my neighbor. Some of you are too young to even understand that statement. But there was a, pen, there was a time in the 70s, 80s, where there was a group called the Emotions. And the Emotions had a song that said, don't ask my neighbor, come to me. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Don't ask my neighbor. Uh, we're in a series about love, and it is easier to talk about this word love than to know what it is or what we are to do with it. Because we use the word love for the fuzzy feelings we have in our stomachs toward a certain person, place, or thing. We use the word love to reflect caring for something or someone. We even use the word broadly toward anything we have good feelings about. So we love this person, and we love that person. But we also love chocolate cake. We also love ice cream. We love this show, or we love this job. We speak of the word love very casually, casually because we connect it to an emotive feeling towards something. But when we talk about love, we are actually talking about the attributes of God. We are talking about the perfections of God and who he is. I want to show you this scripture, 1 John 4, verse number 7 through 8. The Bible says, Beloved, uh, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and, and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. You hear that statement thrown around a lot. You hear people that want to justify a certain behavior because uh, they, they think the thinking is, well, God is love. And in other words, any discussion about love from a biblical standpoint has to start with God because that is who he is. 
It's not just what he does. It's a self-definition. It's, it's like saying to you, I'm a man or I'm black. I, I'm clarifying my, my, my identity. It's an unchanging reality. So when God says he is love, it is defining how he defines himself. So if I'm to understand what love is, then it would be best to take my understanding from someone who is defined by that word. God says you can't, can define me by the word love because I am love. God does not have a narcissistic, self-directed love that only seeks personal fulfillment or even an expression of strong personal desires like we do. But God is love. God is the embodiment of love. God, God's love is, is spontaneous in its source, universal in its scope, long-suffering in intensity, self-sacrificing in character, aggressive in action, and constant in duration. Saying God is love is to say that God is the most self-sacrificial being in the universe and was prepared to go to incredible lengths to set humankind's right. I love God because God loved me on my worst day and my best day. I loved God because God loved me enough not to leave me to my own demise. I love God because God loved reached reach me when I was in the muck and the mire and pulled me out of what I was in and set me on a solid rock to stay. Because love doesn't completely describe God, but God completely defines love. You missed what I just said. Let me rewind that one more time for you to get that. Love doesn't completely describe God, but God does completely define love because he is love. Love is never, his love is never absent from his being or his actions. Everything God does, he does in love because he is love. So even if he have to spank me every now and again, he's spanking me because he loves me. Because mm, he chastised those he loves And if he don't love them Then they are a bastard That's what the Bible says He is the source and the origin of love And the climatic demonstration of his love Came when he sent his only son To die for us on a cross And he did it because You are the object of his love Look at your neighbor Just in case they confuse And say I'm the abject, object of God's love yeah, yeah, yeah. If they don't know what that means, you look back at him and say, he loves me. Uh-huh. Yeah, he loves me. I, he got to love me because, I mean, can't nobody else put up with me like God does. Can't nobody take me like God can. He, he loves me from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. He loves me. He loves me so much. He knows the number of hairs on my head. He loves me so much that he knows my frame. He loves me so much that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made in his image because he loves me just that much. And this is what we find in this parable that Jesus is teaching in our text. This story or parable, let the church say parable. Parable is an earthly story with a spiritual reality or truth. It is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So whenever you see uh, parables in the Bible, it is God giving us an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Whenever Jesus teaches a parable, it does two things. Watch this. Whenever you read a parable in the Bible, it does two things. One, it's a window by which we can see God. But two, it's a mirror so that we can see ourselves. Mm-hmm. I'm scared of saints that can only see God but can't see themselves. Oh, God, you, you can speak in tongues, but you can't speak to your neighbor. I don't understand that. Uh, you can see God, and you can go into the heavenly realms, and you, you all deep as you want to be, but you don't know how to talk to folk. And God is saying, when I give a parable, it's to show you, get you a window to see God, but a mirror to see yourself. Is there anybody here that say, I'm so grateful he showed me me? Oh, God, because if he didn't show me me, I would have been lost. And the theme, the lesson of this parable is to show us that we are in the, that, that we are to be the arms of compassion to our neighbor and love our neighbor as ourselves. Because Jesus is teaching that we cannot separate our relationship with God from our relationship with others. Let me say that one more time because I need you to get that. Jesus is teaching that you cannot separate your relationship with God from your relationship with others. You cannot be right with God and wrong with people. <laughs> 
if you're going to be right with people, it starts with being right with God. Because how can you love God in whom you've never seen and hate your brother that shows your sister that you see every single day? I want you to grab the hand of your neighbor, shake it real good and say, you got to love me. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Shut down the shouting and dancing. You got to love me. Speak in all the tongues you want, but you need to love me and speak to me in English because you can't hate me and love God at the same time. You got to I need you to look down your road say you got to love me yeah with my crazy self with my inconsistent self with my night not so nice self sometimes you got to love me and if you want to be a Christian you got to love the unlovable Lord they didn't like that point and Jesus gives this parable because this lawyer comes to test Jesus and asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus responds by asking this man, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Jesus asking this question because this man was not a civil law lawyer. I know the text says lawyer, but he was an expert in the law. He was an expert in the law. It means he was a religious man. Some s translators even call him a scribe. He, he was a very religious man. He already knew the answer, but his motive was not right because he was trying to draw Jesus into a debate and antagonize him. And Jesus does something that's amazing. Jesus didn't even answer him. Jesus answers the question with a question. Because Jesus is trying to get the man to think. Okay, because if I can engage, engage your thinking, then I can change your heart. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, I got to answer your question with a question because I need to engage your intellect. Uh-huh, you don't believe me. Go all the way back to Genesis. Uh, Adam, where art thou? Now, God is omniscient, omnipresent. He knows where Adam was, but he was asking the question because he needed to engage Adam's thinking for him to realize that you've drifted from where you, I put you, and now I'm trying to get you to realize you need to come all the way back. Uh, is there anybody in here that say, I'm glad that sometimes God doesn't answer everything every prayer but he answers the prayer with a question what's up what you doing where you at how what you mean by that God sometimes has to confront you in order to change your thinking because if he can change your thinking then he can change your behavior and if I can change your behavior he can change your life and is there anybody in here that said I'm glad that he doesn't answer every prayer but sometimes he leaves me with a question and Jesus asks him, he says, what does the word say? This is why we must always ask ourselves, what does the Bible say? What does God's word have to say about my marriage problem? What does God's word have to say about my emotional problem? What does God's word have to say about my money problem? Because as Christians, we need to think biblically. Oh, God, we need to have our minds so saturated in God's word that we filter everything through the lens of scripture, not our feelings. Tap your neighbor real good and say, get up out your feelings. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Yeah, you need to, uh, Jasmine Sullivan, you need to get rid of them feelings. You need to do something with all them feelings because not your feelings is going to change anything, but it's the word of God. Ah, uh, not your self-help, but it's the word of God because the word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall stand forever. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You need to get up, up out of those feelings and you need to get some word because the word is what's going to change you. I can't look at my situation and get caught up in my feelings. I got to look at my situation and know that he's made me more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Is there anybody in here and say, I got a word from the Lord Jesus says what do the words say about it and look what the man answered Jesus by reciting Deuteronomy 6 or what the Jews call the Shammai uh, the, the, the thing that they would repeat over and over again as soon as they get up in the morning hear O Israel the Lord is one God and you must worship him with all your heart all your soul all your strength and all your mind in other words, nothing should come between you and God. 
when you worship the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, your strength, and your mind, nothing can come between you and God. Ah, God, I don't care how much I love you, but nothing can come between me and God. I don't care how long we've been there, but nothing can come between me and God. See, you got to have such a grip on God that you refuse to let anybody snatch away your joy and pull your peace because nothing can come between me and God. And if you got a problem with my God, get out my car. If you got a problem with my God, get out my house because you can ask for me and my house. We gonna serve the Lord. I refuse to let anybody come between me and my... Ain't no relationship I can get in that's gonna make me come between me and my God. But there's a caveat because in Deuteronomy 6 it says love the Lord with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and all your strength. But there's a caveat because you keep reading and then it says and love your neighbor as yourself. Because this becomes the crucial means of evaluating our love when you can love your neighbor. Because few of us have any difficulty loving ourselves. <laughs> oh, you love you. You love you. Uh huh. Yes, you do. You love you. I think I just don't love myself. That's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. You love you. Because listen, if we're in a fight uh, and it's between me and a bear, you're going to help you. Because at the end of the day, you love you. Oh, yes, you do. You love you. You love you so much that you go after everything that you want. You love you so much that you don't even pray about some stuff. You love you so much. Oh, y'all want me to go there? You love you so much that it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks or anybody else say. All that matters is you just independent all by yourself. You could do this. You, you could do this all by yourself. You just, I love yourself. You love you. And God's saying when you can love your neighbor, it is a perfect measure uh, of your spiritual maturity in God. Jesus says, by this men will know that you are my, my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus says, says you have answered right yeah you answered right you did yeah yeah love the lord with all your heart your mind strength and all that and love your neighbor as yourself and then jesus says something that's so funny he says guess what do this and you will live now people misinterpret that thinking that all i got to do is just love my neighbor love god and i'm going to heaven touch your neighbor say that ain't it jesus is not saying that work is what gets you in. If you just love God and love your neighbor, then you're going to heaven. That's not what he's actually saying. What he's actually saying is that we haven't done that yet. Okay. The law was not to save us, but to condemn us. To show us our need for a savior. The point of the story was to expose him to the place that he repented and agreed that he had not loved God or that he had not loved his neighbor as he should. Because true repentance agrees with God. But instead, he wanted to, watch this, argue scripture. Instead of facing the reality that he had a love deficiency, he asked Jesus, all right, well, I, I'm, you know, well, I got another question. Who is my neighbor? Because Jews believe, I need you to hear this, I need you to hear this. I don't want to start nothing, but I'm going to say it. Because Jews believe that only other Jews were their neighbors. So you got to get a more global perspective on preaching sometimes and hear what's really being said. Jews believed that only other Jews were their neighbors. No one outside of the Jewish race was a neighbor to them. And what made it worse was religious Jews at this time believed only other religious Jews were their neighbors. So it's easy to kill people in Gaza. Okay, y'all want me to keep on going? Because when you only believe that your neighbor it looks like you and sounds like you and worships like you, then you got a problem because it's easy for you to desecrate another people when all you believe is, and I've discovered everybody that's skin to you ain't kin to you. All right. I'm coming for you now. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Just because you black like this and may not be black like this don't mean we all on the same page. Oh, God, I wish I had somebody right there. 
So this scribe is trying to limit the commandments. Well, who is my neighbor? So that it made it possible for him to obey it sufficiently enough to merit in eternal life. And Jesus tells this parable to let them know that your neighbor, watch this, your neighbor, watch this, your neighbor is anyone that is in need. Your neighbor is anybody that's in need. Well, who's in need? All us. God, you just missed it. You missed it. You missed it because you thought I was talking about the homeless people on the side of the road. No, baby, you in need. You might not need money, but you need something. You in need of something. Look over at your neighbor and say, you my neighbor. I'm your neighbor. We all neighbors. Uh -huh. We all a part of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. All us in here in need. All us in here stand in need of a savior. All us in here need God to come through. All us in here are neighbors, whether you're black, white, pink, or yellow. It don't matter who you are we are all neighbors where you are gay or straight we are all neighbors where you are rich or poor we are all neighbors so Jesus paints a picture of love through this parable he paints a picture of love through this this parable Jesus said I'm gonna go back to verse number 30 a man was going down from Jerusalem to, Jer Jer to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest, a priest, the pastor, the preacher, happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So I ain't got time for that. So too, a Levite, somebody say Levite. Levite. That's the praise team. When he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Uh -huh. But a Samaritan, somebody say Samaritan. As he traveled, came to the, to the where the man was. When he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him into the inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. This man is attacked by robbers. This man is stripped of his clothes. And the implication that Jesus is giving is that this man was a Jew. Because he's being helped by a Samaritan. And Samaritans were sworn enemies to the Jew. But sometimes God will send your enemy to bless you. <laughs> I'm tired of y'all waiting for your best friend to bless you. God will send an enemy to come bless you. That's why the person on your job that can't do nothing with you has to come and say, you've been promoted. You know why? Because God can put a blessing on you that he'll send an enemy to bless you. This man attacked by robbers, stripped of his clothes, beaten, wounded, left half dead. And three different people encounter this helpless man, but have three different responses. The pastor, the preacher, go down the same road and, and, gets, and goes by on the other side. He had a perfect indifference. The Levite came to the place, saw him, and passed by on the other side. He had an inter interested curiosity, but his curiosity wasn't enough to help. But the Samaritan came to where he was and had compassion on him. He had practical sympathy. The Bible doesn't tell us why the priest and the Levite didn't stop. It doesn't tell us why the first two didn't stop to show love to their neighbor. And my question to you this morning is, what would your neighbor say about you? Because <laughs> you don't see you in the text. Look at your neighbor and say, don't ask my neighbor. Don't you ask my neighbor. Don't you ask my neighbor. Well, pastor, you don't understand. Maybe there were some reasons why they did not help the man. And I struggled with this text this week, and I came across something that just blew my mind. Maybe there were some. I want to give them the two, the two, the, pre, the pastor and the praise team. I want to give them an out this morning. I want to give some reasons that they stopped loving. I want to give you some reasons that stops you from loving. What, what makes you just pass by on the other side and not care anymore? What makes you stop loving the church you go to? What, what makes you stop loving that best friend? What makes you stop loving the person, the child? 
the friend. What makes you stop loving? Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> Ooh, I'm going to preach my soul this morning. Can I give you some reasons that stop us from loving? Number one, our inability to manage past trauma. Let, let's talk. Let's talk. There's a difference between eisegesis and exegesis. Exegesis means you look at the text, you pull and extrapolate principles from the text. Eisegesis means you look at the text and you add principles to it. So I'm doing a little bit more eisegesis than exegesis this morning, but it's still going to be good preaching. All right, you with me? Here we go. Managing past trauma. We don't know because it, it don't say why they didn't stop, but could it be that the reason the priest and the Levite didn't help the man we, because they thought to themselves, what if this man was just laying here pretending he needed help? Be, 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 because the road from Jerusalem to, Jer to, Jer to Jericho was a notoriously dangerous road. Jerusalem is 2,300 feet above sea level. Jericho was about 1,300 feet below sea level. So in a less than 20-mile radius, this road dropped 3,600 feet. It was a narrow road with many sudden turns, which made it the hunting ground for thieves. It was notoriously known that people would get robbed on this road. And because this road is so dangerous, could it be that they were afraid, the priest and the Levite, were afraid of being hurt themselves? Because when you are afraid of being hurt, you will manifest a strong dislike to engaging in activities that carry any potential risk. I'm just trying to preach it this morning. I, I don't want to take any risks so I don't engage myself. So I avoid intimacy. I avoid interaction. I avoid closeness because you have been vulnerable before and a traumatic situation or a negative interaction has left an imprint on your psyche. So now you believe that being hurt is inevitable. So you got to protect yourself from any future pain and disappointment. Uh -huh, you think I ain't talking about you. Come here. You don't get involved in church because you've been church hurt before and you don't want it to happen again you don't want another relationship because of how the last person did you so you keep on walking because you're afraid of being hurt again so you oh, okay let me put it like this you didn't go to war you didn't serve in the military but you got emotional PTSD because now you have a fear of relationships and it brings stress when you're getting close to anyone and you stop loving because you still trying to manage the past trauma you've been through. Uh, I need you to touch your neighbor and say, he's talking about me this morning. That's why it's hard for me to get close. That's why it's hard for me to open up. That's why it's hard to accept you into my life because I'm managing past trauma because I think what you did to me, what they did to me will be what you did to me. But I came to announce to somebody who they were ain't who this is not that. That is a completely different person and if you could ever manage your past trauma, you can get to a place where you can love again. The reason you, 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 you're not loving because you're managing past trauma. You've been married and he can't touch you because you're still managing past trauma. You, 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 you're married and you can't really get close and get intimate because you're managing past trauma. Oh, I got you. No new friends. Because you are still managing past trauma. All right, I'm going to keep it moving. Y'all don't like it. I told you I was going to take a turn. Uh, what's the reasons that stop us from loving, number one? You're managing past trauma, but here's number two, unrealistic expectations. Watch this. The priest and the Levite couldn't discern from a distance the state of the man's condition. They weren't sure if he was dead. And in their culture, I need you to hear this, touching a dead body would make them ceremonially unclean. And if you're dead and I touch you, you will make me unclean. Not realizing that everybody you come in contact with got a little dirt on them. <laughs> Ooh, 
Don't look down your road and say, y'all, all y'all dirty. All y'all, all y'all got a little dirt. All y'all got a little skeleton in your closet. All y'all got a little stuff you came with. All y'all got some drama and some baggage that you came with. I know you came in church and I know you just, you just joined the church and I know you look all cute and innocent, but the devil is a liar. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I don't care who you run into. If they're not Jesus, they're going to have some baggage coming along with them. And now you got unrealistic expectations thinking that they shouldn't have any drama. They shouldn't have any baggage. They shouldn't have any problems. Boo, get your mind right. You came with baggage. You came with drama. You came to the relationship with your own self. And you're going to sit here and act like your stuff don't stink? I smell something. All right. See, this is why you got to understand, looks can be deceiving. <laughs> Touch your neighbor and say, don't judge a, judge a book by its cover. Don't judge a book by its cover. Some of y'all funny. Because now the prevailing thing is... Uh, Sergio, you married, so I'm going to talk to you because I ain't going to talk to the single men. Now the thing that we hear all the time is they got to bring something to the table. I'm coming for you. Sit right there. I didn't work all this and do all that I did to get to where I am. You got to bring something to the table with you. Boo, let me help you. Came to tell somebody, he might not have it all together today. But don't you count him as dead. Oh, I wish I had somebody. She might have some issues today. But don't you count her out. Their current condition don't reflect their future position. And you got to keep your eye on people so you don't judge a book by its cover. Some of us don't love because we have unrealistic expectations of where we think they should be. You got to bring something to the table. I don't have time for, for projects. Come here, boo. Let me open this suit jacket because I'm going to talk grown this morning. Let me remind you that you were a project to God. God had to work a whole lot out in order for you to become who you have become. And how dare you look at somebody else and judge them just on the outward appearance. God, man looks at the exterior, but God looks at the heart. All right. You still don't believe me. Um, one night, one night, one night, uh, President Obama and his wife decided to go out a routine and go for a casual dinner at a restaurant that wasn't very luxurious. When they were seated, the owner of the restaurant asked President, the President's Secret Service if they could please speak to the First Lady in private. They obliged, and Michelle had a conversation with the owner. Following this conversation, true story, following the, the, this conversation, President Obama, when she came back, asked Michelle, why was he so interested in talking to you and not to me? She then let him know that in her teenage years, he had been madly in love with her. Wow. President Obama said, so if you would have married him, you would now be the owner of this lovely restaurant. Michelle responded and said, no, if I had married him, he would now be the president. I need you to give somebody a high five and tell them don't you judge a book by its cover. You don't know who I am in seed form. You don't know who and where God can take me. So if you judge me based upon the car I drive and you judge me based upon the house I live in and you judge me based upon the clothes I got on, you could be missing your blessing. preach this child you get with me I'll make you a president <laughs> the 
The problem with expectation is when people expect something to happen, they expect something to happen without any reason or evidence for it. And if you're not careful, unrealistic expectations will quickly turn into resentment. Needing the person to always respond how you want them is guaranteed to disappoint you. And we shut down relationships because we have unrealistic expectations and expectations feed frustration. If you expect for all church folk to always be nice and always love you and always be kind, you are delusional. You might as well quit church today. You might as well go home now. But all of us got issues and all of us got problems. And I'm not always going to get it right. And sometimes I'm going to say the wrong thing. And sometimes I'm not going to speak. It don't mean I hate you. You just got to understand that everybody don't have unrealistic expectations. You mad now? Because you can't understand why all them people at my job act like that. Boo. They crazy just like you. Y'all just working out y'all crazy together. All right. Reasons that stop us from loving, number one, managing past trauma. Number two, unrealistic expectations. But here's the third reason why we stop loving, emotionally unavailable. Could it be that the priest and the Levite didn't stop because, watch this, they were in a hurry. I ain't have time to stop. Now, while some of y'all didn't respond to that because you like, that's me. I'm busy. You booked and busy with Netflix. You booked and busy. <laughs> Child folk kill me. You booked and busy. Watch this. Could it be that they had things to do and could not be slowed down by engaging with this man? Maybe they had someone waiting on them and they couldn't stop. Maybe they had an appointment that was more important than helping this man. Watch this because sometimes the biggest hindrances to developing relationships is our inability to give up our emotional freedom. And when I'm unwilling to give up my emotional freedom, then a lack of presence or engagement will be the result. I, I realized this while I was putting this message together. This is why we can't get certain church people to commit. Because you want to be emotionally free. You don't want the constraints of commitment. Because commitment constrains. I'm going to teach this anyhow. That's why I can sleep with you and your best friend. Because emotional oh, freedom allows me to go anywhere and do anything. Come here, you free spirit. Uh-huh. You all over the place. Because you want to be emotionally free. You don't want to be constrained by commitment. And when you are emotionally unavailable, you can't respond to emotional needs or cues that lead and it leads to a lack of intimacy. So you, are emo you, are, you, are, you like emotional freedom because you are not comfortable feeling your own emotions or sharing your emotions with others or being present and responsive to someone else's emotions. Mm. <laughs> this is why some of our children run to the wrong hands. Because they run into people who will grab them emotionally when we have shut down with them emotionally. <laughs> and when relationships need empathy, an emotional unavailable person cannot give that. They avoid intimacy and commitment. They get defensive easily. And they aren't available. I'm busy. I got stuff to do. You ain't that busy. Watch this. Come here. Emotionally unavailable people. Let me talk to you. Don't you ain't gotta wave your hand. You ain't gotta lift your hand. Talk about you talking about me, Pastor. Just look forward, keep on blinking. Don't say nothing. Don't give it away to your neighbor. And now here's what happens with emotionally unavailable people. You have attachment issues that make you detach when the relationship calls for engagement. That's why some people can only go so far with you. 
Because as soon as they reach that line, you shut it down. Here's the only problem. You ready? Here's the only problem. The only problem is with emotionally unavailable people, you require from others a level of loyalty you're not willing to give yourself. <laughs> I'm going to preach this today. Why? Because you are emotionally unavailable. But I came to tell somebody, you got to plug back into that relationship. You got to plug back into that marriage. Just because you lay next to them, just because you have sex with them, don't mean you are emotionally attached to them. Oh God, you got to plug back in. I came to talk to somebody. You got to lay your emotions out on the line. You got to be vulnerable before somebody and create the intimacy needed. You got to have the hard conversations and open yourself up because you are fe you're fearful of being rejected. But when you are emotionally available and the other person is emotionally available, they ain't going to hurt you or harm you in the way that you think they're going to hurt you and harm you because they're going to catch you every time you open yourself up. Reasons to stop that stop us from loving. Number one, managing past trauma. Number two, unrealistic expectations. Number three, emotionally unavailable. Number four, insecurities and low self-esteem. We don't love because we're insecure. Watch this. This injured man obviously needed help from someone. Um, uh, he needed help from someone. But could it be that they walked down and said, I can't do nothing, I'm just a preacher. I, I, I ain't no doctor. I, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not, I'm a singer. I, I, I don't have the, I can't do that. I'm not trained to handle that. That issue I can't handle. I have the, I don't have those skills. I can't do this. There's someone more qualified than me. There's someone better than me. And when you struggle with insecurities and low self-esteem, you either choose not to get in a relationship or you pick people that you have to dummy down to be with. Can we just be honest? Can we just be honest? Let's just be honest for a minute. Can you just think back of a time you were with somebody that you know wasn't on your level, but because of your insecurities and because of how you felt about yourself, you dummied down yourself in order to be with them, and now you skinning and grinning that jokes ain't even funny? Oh, they don't like me over here. Let me come over here. Now, now, you going out to eat with somebody and the conversation don't even match up with your intellect and you got to dummy down yourself just to be with them because you feel so insecure that you can't get anybody better. I might as well take what I got because I don't know what's going on. I don't know. I've, it's been a long time since I've been by myself and I don't know what I, I don't know if anybody going else going to call my phone. I'm so tired of being alone. I'm so tired of on my own. You just so tired tired and you so insecure and you think that nobody of substance and standard can ever come your way but the devil is a liar when you know who you are you don't have to dummy down yourself for nobody when you know who you are you don't have to lower your standards for anybody to be in your life because as long as I got standards that's all that matters I refuse to get in a relationship with anybody that is not on my level Oh, I see your face. I see your face. How dare you think you better than some other people? How dare you think you all that? You think you all that in a bag of chips? How dare you talk around and you walk around? Boo, don't get mad at me because I got a standard. But you, ma you married your dummy down. The devil is a liar. I'd rather have a standard any day. You got to come up to be with me. But I ain't coming down to be with you. God brought me from a mighty long way. And you think I'm going to go back to Lodabar? The devil is a liar. All right, I ain't talking to the married people, I'm talking to the single folk. Because the fear of rejection is so overwhelming that you don't want to take a chance lowering your self-esteem even more. And you create a self-fulfilling prophecy when you tell yourself you're not good enough or that others won't like you. But God sees your heart and God knows what he has for you. Let me keep moving because somebody getting upset. <laughs> Said you're going to have to walk me to the car. Somebody going to try to jump me, okay? The reason that, that we stop loving 
is number one, we, our inability to manage past trauma. Number two, unreal, unrealistic expectation. Number three, emotionally unavailable. Number four, insecurities and low self-esteem. But here's number five, we always looking for something better. Maybe, maybe, maybe this wounded man, maybe they looked at this wounded man and said, he ain't so innocent. Maybe he was a thief and got knocked in the head by other thieves. You know how we make up stuff in our own head. Maybe, maybe, maybe he ended up like this, this situation because of his own foolishness. Maybe he should have known better to be out on the Jericho Road and not have a weapon. It's his fault. Watch this. Because we are always triggered when um, and we, we are triggered and start to blame people by our own individual differences. Because, watch this, blaming is easier than managing my needs more effectively. Can I say that one more time? Blaming is easier than managing my needs more effectively. See, I, I, didn't, I, I was going to say this like I wrote it, but I didn't, wrote, I didn't write this, but I don't know who wrote it, but it, may, it blessed me. We make jailers of people in prisons of circumstances. <laughs> okay, we make jailers of people in prisons of circumstances. We, we drop one thing in exchange for another. So I'd rather blame you because I'm trying to find my out. Because if I find my out, then I can go see if the grass is greener. See, the problem is, you are always looking for your next iPhone. Thank you very much. <laughs> you are always looking for your upgrade. So you think the next woman going to be your upgrade. And you think the next man going to be your upgrade. And you think the next friend going to be your upgrade. And you think your next church going to be your upgrade. And your next pastor going to be your upgrade. Because you think the grass is always greener. So the only way that you can excuse yourself for looking for the grass is that you got to make sure you blame in order for you to look for some other grass. But I'm here to let you know, honey, if you can't love the one you want, you better love the one you're with. You better stop looking here, there, and everywhere. But thank God for what God sent you. You got you a good woman. You got you a good man. You ain't no need of looking anywhere else. What you found is the best thing God got for you. And if you water your own grass, your own grass will get a little greener okay I wish I had somebody ain't nobody gonna cook for you like that ain't nobody else gonna wash your clothes like that ain't nobody else gonna make a way for you like that ain't nobody gonna pay the bills for you like that and you got the nerve to be looking for somebody else honey water your own grass yeah. I feel the Lord is moving me into another direction and I feel the Lord is sending me to another church alright boo go on ahead I ain't gonna fight with you God bless you praying for you hallelujah glory and they get dissatisfied with that church when that pastor don't come visit you in the hospital uh huh but this pastor come and show up and call you and see how you're doing and you got the nerve to try to look for another honey you found the one hey God and until God moves you to something else sit still and water your own grass Look what that church got. They give. Look how that church look. They give. Have you been watering your own grass? Let me get off of it. Let me get off of it. Let me get off of it. Touch your neighbor so they ain't just mad at me and say, water your own grass. Water your own grass. All right. <sighs> so those are the reasons why I cannot love how 
do you love again? I ain't long. I'm almost there. I'm going to let you out. I know you got a game to get to. Um, how do you love again? How, how do you love again? Three quick points and I'm out of here. Number one, how do you love again? You got to open your eyes. Open your eyes. I'm in a text, the Samaritan came to where the man was, and the Bible specifically says he saw him. When the Samaritan saw him, he didn't ask him, how you get here? He didn't ask the man, why are you traveling alone? Text never says he had a conversation with him. Text says he saw him. Because when someone opens their eyes, they don't rebuke you when your wounds are already bleeding. Why are you kicking me when I'm already down? But he had compassion on him because compassion cannot see someone in need without helping. Here it is. Compassion accepts the consequences of getting involved because they cannot bear to turn away. Come in, let me talk to you. Every parent in here, that's why you don't give up on that child. That's why you, I don't care how they act. I don't care what they do. I don't care how much trouble they get in. That's why you can't give up on that child. While the school gives up on them. And while family gives up on them. And even if they daddy or mama gave up on them, you never give up on them. Because when your eyes are open, you will keep going after them and making sure you can do everything in your power to take care of them. Look at somebody say, open your eyes. Open your eyes. That's why you can't give up on that relationship. Because you open your eyes and you can't look and not have compassion. Didn't God have compassion on you? Didn't God was kind to you? When you were crying on the side of your bed, tears flowing out your eyes, didn't know how you was going to come through, the love of God came and wrapped you up in the middle of his arms, and you knew everything was going to be all right. I need you to take five seconds and give God glory for the compassion of God in your life, that God had compassion on you. He saw you in what you were in. I told you I'm moving quickly. How do you love again? You got to open your eyes. But here's number two. Number two, you got to open your heart. You open your eyes, but you got to open your heart. The text says that the Samaritan saw him and took pity on him. Do you know there's a difference between sympathy and compassion? Sympathy is feeling bad for another person's plight. But compassion always involves action. What he saw with his eyes moved his heart. God told me to tell somebody, you got to move towards it so your heart can be open again. You got to move towards it. Do me a favor. I need you to just lift one hand and say, Lord, Lord open, my heart. open my heart. Watch this. Why do you need your heart to be open? So that you can be sensitive to the needs of others again. Some of us are too hard. We have a stony heart. Our heart is not made of flesh because we, we have a stony heart. We don't, we're not sensitive to the needs of others. So we can walk right past people. Never ask them, how are you doing? How's your day going? Never have a conversation with them because our heart is so hardened to everything that we've been through. Listen, every person that's trying to talk to you don't want something from you. You got to open your heart and realize that sometimes I just need a connection. Sometimes somebody on your job just needs somebody to pray with them. Sometimes somebody in your family just needs a phone call a text message to say how you doing you ain't got to have a three hour conversation but you can open your heart somebody lift your hands and say open my heart Lord um, here's the problem that I have in church here's the problem that I have in church the problem I have in church is the weight of responsibility for the, com for the pastor to be compassionate is greater than the responsibility of the people being compassionate So you will sit right next to people who are catching hell and you can feel it on them. 
but you never grab the hand and say, hey, baby, it's going to be all right. Ooh, I wish I had somebody right there. I need to teach you how to be compassionate in church. Grab the hand of your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't care what you're going through. God sat me next to you to let you know it's going to be all right. You're going to come through this. God going to make a way out of no way. Is there anybody in here that say, I didn't come to church just to jump and shout? Sometimes I came to church because I need somebody to encourage me about what I'm going through. I need somebody to sit next to me and let me know it's going to be okay. If pastor never preach, if pastor never give me a word, I can get a word from my neighbor that's sitting right next to me. How do you love again? You got to open your eyes. You got to open your heart. And I'm done. You got to open your hand. The text says in verse 34 that the Samaritan bandaged the man's wounds. Now this messed me up. Because, hey, what did he use for a bandage? The text says they robbed a man and took his clothes. So if he ain't got no clothes, how are you bandaging his wounds? The Samaritan had to tear his own clothes to provide bandages. Can I tell you something? This ain't a giving message, but I need you to understand the principle of giving. Giving opens your hand so that you can release, so that you're in a position to receive. And the reason why some of us ain't receiving, because we ain't releasing. When you release love, you get love back. Here's the problem. The problem is you want love from the very place that you released it to. And I got a parent in here that can tell you, sometimes you can love that child and they hate you back. Because when you release where I sowed, that might not be the place I reaped. But I'm still going to reap one way or the other. That's why I don't stop giving. Because if I gave over here, God can bless me over there. You got to open your hand. Watch this. He bandaged his wounds. And then the text says, I'm done. It says he poured oil and wine on the man's wounds. He put them in the end. He did all that. I don't want to get to that. All I want to deal with is oil and wine. He put oil and man, wine on the man's wounds. Oil is to soothe. Wine is to disinfect. Okay, I need you to get this. I need you to get this. I need you to get this. Oil is to soothe. Wine is to disinfect. So, if I'm going to be in a relationship with someone, that means the relationship has to be two-sided. I have to be in a position that I can give wine and oil. If I give oil only, it never deals with the infection. So I will soothe you into a place where you stay dysfunctional. But if I give wine only, I will burn you. And if you're burned over and over again, you can't heal from it. Uh-oh, could it be that we in one-sided relationships? That we're either being soothed into staying dysfunctional and never growing, or we keep getting burned. Watch this. God told me to end this message like this. God is speaking to this church, and he's saying, I need you to evaluate your relationships and make sure they are two-sided. I should be able to tell you you're great and wonderful. And I should be able to tell you, I didn't like how you did that. You know what I'm experiencing in this, this time? With these modern day Christians. These newfangled Christians. These newfangled Christians don't like to be told nothing. Because the minute you tell them something, they jump ship and they out of here. 
How dare you? You don't know me. You don't know what I struggle with. You don't know what I'm going through. I don't care. I see a wound. And I'm trying to help you heal. Jesus. I need you to just grab your neighbor hand and say, neighbor, I need you to heal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you can't go into another relationship being that toxic. You can't go into another relationship being that uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh with that poison on the inside of you. You got to heal. And if God sent you in here to heal, I came to tell somebody you need to heal on today. Because you can't keep dragging that stuff with you into everything. Being wounded over and over again. Left half dead and need somebody else to come and resurrect you all over again. This time when God brings you out, I want you to stay out. Don't go back to the road no more but whom the sun sets free is free indeed is there anybody in freedom this morning that say I'm ready to heal I'm tired of having toxic relationships I need to heal so 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 can we start asking your neighbor I mean, this sermon was good. It's wonderful. You shouted. But when can we start asking your neighbor? Because maybe if you start treating your neighbor right, maybe more people will come to Christ. You thought this sermon was all about your boo? This ain't about your boo. I'm glad you got a little tidbits in there. But this is about your relationship in God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Check. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. Oh. You mean I got to love church folk? Even if they do me wrong? Even if there's a misunderstanding? No, check now. Check, check, check it now. Because loving the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and your spirit does not, does not mean anything if you can't love your neighbor. You ready? I'm done. I'm going to let y'all go. I know y'all ready to go. And it's hard to love your neighbor when you sit in the seat of offense. Can I tell you something? This is the most offended church I've ever seen in my life. I'm offended. I'm offended. I'm offended. Everybody offended. I ain't talking about freedom. I'm just talking about the church universal. Everybody offended. Everybody get offended. We are so offended and now we got blogs that talk about how dysfunctional and messed up the church is. We so offended that people spread their poison everywhere. And we say nothing about it. Because everybody just offended. I'm offended. You walked by me and didn't speak. I'm offended. How many times you got up out the bed and didn't speak to God? I'm offended for how what they said, how they said, what they said. Did you ever tell them? Or did you get on the phone and tell everybody else? I'm offended. I'm offended. Everybody offended. And God is saying, hey, I'm trying to bring you into alignment, but I can't bring you into alignment because I'm asking your neighbor. How are you treating them? Do you talk about love or do you demonstrate the love? Because love is not what you say. It is what you do.